Hey guys, how you doing? So welcome to chapter 16. This is the last uh, chapter in the book. Um, and in this chapter, we're going to look at uh, genetic crosses, uh, rules of the game, okay? Uh, so let's jump into it. So, um, all right, uh, here's the information. Uh, here's the key knowledge. We're going to be looking at understanding monohybrid crosses, dihybrid and test crosses, looking specifically at monohybrid crosses, uh, autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, excellent and Y-linked traits, and how the patterns of inheritance occurs in each of those ones there. Okay, we're also going to look at dihybrid crosses, looking at independent and linked genes, and then also look at the consequences, what happens as a result of some of those crossovers. Okay, uh, so let's jump into it. Uh, we're going to start with monohybrid crosses. Um, now, a monogenic trait is a trait that is determined by one gene. And so when you have a monohybrid cross, what that is referring to is a cross uh, between two individuals uh, around the uh, involving the alleles of just one gene. So we're interested, interested to see uh, what happens if you play around with just one gene and the different variations within that gene. Okay? Uh, let's use albinism as our example. So albinism is a congenital absence of pigmentation, usually in the skin, the hair, and the eyes. Now, congenital meaning at birth, absence means uh, they are lacking in pigmentation. So here's a few examples of uh, animals and people that are lacking in uh, pigmentation, there's your uh, little hedgehog, uh, there is a ferret, a, t a tortoise, and also an African woman who is al uh, who's an albino, uh, but has a normal pigmentation child. Okay. Um, now, pigmentation is usually caused by uh, melanin. Now, melanin um, is produced by special cells uh, called melanocytes, yeah? um, and they are found in your skin, your hair, and your eyes. Okay. Um, there is a particular gene called the TYR gene located on chromosome 11, which encodes for an enzyme called tyrosinase. And that enzyme is what catalyzes or speeds up that production of melanin. If you have the enzyme and it is working, you produce melanin and you become darker. Okay? Uh, the, TY, the TYR gene has two alleles. Uh, allele capital A produces normal tyrosinase, which results in pigmentation. However, there is a second variant, uh, which is a lowercase a, um, and it produces a faulty tyrosinase, which means that particular enzyme is not working, and it cannot uh, produce melanin as a result, and you get an albino, okay? So lowercase a. So from that, you can tell that this particular trait is a recessive trait. Albinism is a recessive trait because of the lowercase a resulting in the albino, okay? We're going to use the Punnett square to um, show the cross between these individuals, and we're going to start by looking at two heterozygous parents. Now, uh, heterozygous parents means their genotypes are different. Both their alleles are different from one another. Capital A, lowercase a, yeah, is heterozygous. That's mum, or that's dad, whichever one, and that's mum. And if we draw the cross, we can now determine what the possible outcomes. There are four our possible outcomes. Here's the first one, capital A, capital A. Here's the second one, capital A, lowercase a. Third one is the same, and the last one being two lowercase a's. Remember, it is a recessive trait, which means two lowercase a would result in your albino. Okay? Uh, all other cases result in a normal pigmentation individual, and from that you can see that capital A, lowercase a, is also a carrier. Now, from this we can determine a few things. Yeah, that um, the chance of producing an albino child is one in four for two heterozygous parents. And also, the fact that normal pigmentation occurs even in the heterozygous individual compared to a homozygous dominant individual means that this particular trait is a complete dominance trait. Yeah? By having just one of this, it masks it completely. And so you get the same here as here, indicating complete dominance. Okay? Now, let's do a second cross between a homozygous dominant father and a homozygous recessive mother. Homozygous meaning the same letter and dominant meaning they're both capitals, and then the same letter, recessive, meaning they're both lowercase, okay? So there's your father, dominant homozygous, and the mother, homozygous recessive, and if you do the crosses, you get capital A, low, capital A, capital A, lowercase a in all four cases, okay? The resulting phenotype, all normal, but carrying individuals, yeah? That they carry that trait for uh, albinism, but they don't exhibit it themselves, okay? Third example, looking at a homozygous recessive father and a heterozygous mother, yeah? There is the homozygous recessive father who is also an al uh, albino, albino, and then a capital A, lowercase a, mother who is a carrier. 
And from that, you can see two of them, capital A, lowercase a, and the other two, lowercase a, lowercase a, resulting in two normal outcomes and then two albino outcomes there. Okay, 50-50 chance of producing an individual with albinism. Okay, um, let's look at another example now. Uh, we're going to look at an example uh, called achondroplasia. Achondroplasia is one of the most common forms of dwarfisms, okay? Characterized by a short stature. Males tend to be about 131 centimeters, females 123. Uh, they have shortened limbs and digits, and they also have a larger head and prominent forehead, okay? Um, now, achondroplasia is caused by a mutated FGFR3 gene, okay? The, it's located on chromosome 4, and the FGFR3 protein is inhibiting bone growth and leads to shortened limbs, which means that particular protein reduces bone growth and results in achondroplasia. Okay. Peter Dinklage is a really popular example. Um, he is a, an individual or uh, a star from the Game of, Game of Thrones series, and he has achondroplasia. Um, now, if we map out uh, the possible outcomes on a Punnett square, you're going to get a slightly different result. The first thing you will notice is this particular aspect here, uh, which results in the death of a child. Now, achondroplasia, um, by having one capital A, means that uh, the individual will have inhibited bone growth and shortened limbs, okay? What that means is that capital A is a dominant trait. Achondroplasia is a dominant trait. However, by having two dominant alleles, um, the bone growth inhibition, which means uh, you know, stopping the bone growth, is too severe and the child dies, right, before it is born. And so that's why you can't have two capital A's uh, there and it, the child just dies, yeah? which means achondroplasia is really actually capital A, lowercase a, which means it is a dominant trait, but it is an incomplete dominant trait because this outcome of a heterozygous individual is different from an individual with a homozygous dominant uh, genotype. Okay, um, If you have two lowercase a, it means you are normal, and the majority of the population will have two lowercase a's, uh, resulting in normal um, growth, okay? Um, achondroplasia is also, or the FGFR3 gene is also considered what we call a lethal gene, where the presence of one of or multiple um, alleles of that gene results in the death of an organism. Yeah, it's, 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 it results in the, the person or the, the organism dying. Now, there are two types of lethality, okay? You can have a recessive lethal, where you need two copies of it to result in the death, or you can have a dominant lethal where one copy of the gene results in the death. Now, uh, the achondroplasia is a recessive lethal because you need two copies of it. Now, something to note, the term recessive lethal here and dominant lethal here is not referring to recessive and dominant traits, yeah? The recessiveness of the, le the lethal gene is referring to the fact that you need two copies of it for it to be resulting in death, and the dominant meaning you only need one copy of it to result in death, okay? Um, another uh, version of uh, lethal genes is the agouti color in mice. So, um, you know, if, if you sort of look at mice, generally you have mice that come in kind of uh, two color variations. You've got the yellow, and you've got the agouti color, which is that kind of uh, the blackish, brownish kind of color in the mice, okay? Um, so that particular coat is determined by uh, a particular gene uh, called the agouti gene, uh, represented by A uh, capital and then this little Y there, right? Now, that capital A Y results in a yellow coat color, okay? And if you have one of the copies, you will have a yellow coated mice, okay, or mouse, sorry. Um, if you have two lowercase a's, it results in the agouti color. Uh, mice, which is the, the brownish, blackish color, okay? However, if you have two capitals, it results in the death of the mice, right? And what that means is in every single cross between the yellow mice here, yeah, this individual is a yellow mice, uh, mouse, and this individual is a yellow mouse as well. Um, and so what happens is in every scenario, there's always a one in quarter chance of the offspring dying if both parents are yellow, right? And so that kind of gives you a good idea. The surviving offspring have a two to one ratio, two chances of being yellow and one chance of being the agouti colored, okay? And that's the phenotype that results there. 
Okay, um, now let's look at a separate example. Now this example actually was actually on one of your sacks and I gave you the information, but I didn't actually explain what the X-linked actually means. So X-linked genes are slightly different because so far all of our examples are from genes located on autosomes, the first 22 pairs. There are some traits that are considered X-linked because they appear on the X chromosome. Um, and also, you know, while I'm talking about that, some traits can also be on the Y chromosome and are therefore Y-linked. Yeah, so if they're X-linked, it's because whatever the trait is, is sitting in the X chromosome and therefore it's going to look slightly different in terms of the Punnett square that we end up drawing because it's on the X chromosome and males only have one X chromosome, right? So X-linked genes located on the X chromosome, they differ from autosomals because males only have one copy of the X chromosome, okay? So here's a few examples. Muscular dystrophy, which was the example on your last sack, uh, red-green color blindness, um, and hemophilia A and B, which is a blood clotting disorder where uh, the body is unable to clot blood properly and the person just continually bleeds out during incidents, okay? Uh, we're gonna look at uh, muscular dystrophy or DMD, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Um, is a degenerative disease caused by a faulty dystrophin gene. Okay, now dystrophin um, is a muscle fiber, right? And so Duchenne muscular dystrophy is when something goes wrong with the muscle fiber and results in an individual with um, non-functioning muscles um, or for the, for the most part within their body, okay? Um, so we're gonna cross between a carrier mother and a normal father, okay? Here is the Punnett square showing that, okay? Now let me point out a few things before we start looking at the possible outcomes, okay? Notice how rather than assigning a random letter, if it is an X-linked, you assign the X chromosome to represent the X-linked and the small um, superscript letter is referring to the particular disease. So XD for um, DMD or mus muscular dystrophy, capital D and lowercase d, yeah? Um, now, the father's genotype is going to look slightly different because he has one X chromosome, which in this case here is a capital D, and a, a Y chromosome there to represent the Y chromosome that he has instead of the two Xs that moms will have, okay? Now, based on this, hopefully you'll be able to take a look at the possible outcomes given to you there and determine that DMD is an X-linked recessive condition because of that lowercase d there. It is an X-linked recessive, which means if you have an XD uh, capital, it is resulting in a normal phenotype. Yeah, you do not have muscular dystrophy um, there. And so the outcomes are all different now. You've got four different outcomes because of that Y chromosome, okay? This individual here and this individual here are the daughters or the, uh, the chance of having a daughter and this individual here and here are the chances of having a son. So if, you know, this particular cross happened and the child is a girl, we are looking at these two possibilities. If the child is a boy, we look at these two possibilities. So it's a 50-50 chance depending on the gender of the child, okay? So for girls, uh, if you have a carrier mum with a normal dad, you end up with half the chances of having a capital XD, capital XD, and the other half ca chance of ca having capital XD, lowercase xd, right? Both of which results in a normal child. So you can immediately see there, right, um, that um, that the girls have, have it a little bit easier because they've got a higher chance of having normal uh, because you need two copies of the lowercase d to result in DMD. Now males are less fortunate because they only have one copy of the X chromosome which means their possibility of getting the disease is higher. Um, if a male has a capital X D Y, it's normal uh, or he's normal and then if he has a capital uh, lowercase X D Y, he will have muscular dystrophy. So you can see there, chances for males is actually 50% chance of developing DMD. For females, it is almost, uh, it's pretty much none, okay? Uh, girls uh, have a very small chance of actually getting that unless mom already has uh, muscular dystrophy or dad has muscular dystrophy, yeah? Um, Okay, um, so that was the example for muscular dystrophy um, and you can expect the color blindness and some of the other ones are also very similar to that. Uh, we're gonna end on this one looking at test crosses. Now, uh, in uh, sort of in more kind of um, traditional sense, uh, 
when we're not sure of what a genotype of a particular individual is, we can actually identify uh, what that genotype is by crossing it with a homozygous recessive individual. If we know um, that an organism has a dominant phenotype, sometimes we don't know whether that phenotype is a homozygous one, which means it's, you know, it's, it's two capitals, or a heterozygous, which means it's a capital and a lowercase, and that individual carries a particular trait. Yeah? Um, and so we do these test crosses um, to determine its genotype. Okay? Um, so for example, um, let's look at our friend the guinea pig. If we know that a guinea pig has black fur, right, and we know that black fur has a dominant trait over white fur, how do we know whether it is capital B, capital B, or capital B, lowercase b, right? We don't know whether it's complete dominance or incomplete dominance. We can only see the black fur, right, which is the phenotype. You can't see the genotype um, in a traditional sense, okay? So you need to actually do a test cross to figure it out. So how do we do that? We cross it with an, a white guinea pig, right, which we know uh, is going to be a homozygous recessive trait, right? And so here is your Punnett square. But what I've done is I've just kept out um, the individual with the black fur to try and identify its genotype. If it's white, we know that it's recessive and we know that it will exhibit a lowercase b, lowercase b genotype. And that lowercase b gets passed on to all particular cases. Now then what we, what we do is we then look for the outcome. Okay? So in this particular case, let's say you had your white individual, you have your black fur individual, you cross them, and then half the litter comes out black and half the litter comes out white. If half the litter comes out black, then we know then there's at least one capital B in there. However, if the other half comes out white, then we know that there is also a lowercase b within the genotype, and from that we can infer capital B on this side and lowercase b on this side, resulting in a heterozygous black fur individual, which is a carrier for the white. Um, the white coat color, okay, so or fur color, yeah. So that's a test cross, yeah. Exercising some of those things and trying to figure out what some of those test crosses are, um, are being very useful there, okay. All right, uh, we're going to stop it there. Next lesson, we're going to take a look at dihybrid crosses and some of those things there, okay. Hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I'll catch you guys then.